Spring is the time when life renews itself, a symbol of mankind's hope for life after death. I want to share with you a story about that hope, not as told by a philosopher or a preacher, but as told by a nine-year-old boy with leukemia. He's never said, why me? He's never said, you know, why has God done this to me? Corey was only three years old when doctors told his mother he had leukemia. So he they sat us in a room, and Corey was in there playing in the corner, and I was sitting there alone, and the doctor came back with tears in his eyes and um, sat down and took my hand, and I thought, uh-oh, the old Dr. Welby routine. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm really sorry, but um, I prepared you in the wrong way. What it looks like we're dealing with is leukemia. Despite his years of illness, Corey seemed a regular rough-and-tumble kid when we met him three months ago. He loves games and is good at them. He was goalie on his soccer team, one of the freshest break dancers at his school, an intermediate skier on the slopes. You wouldn't know that he was dying, but he knew. He even told us what dying is like. We were kind of floating around and up there until you reach the bridge. What does the bridge look like? It's a different colored rainbow. What's on the other side of the bridge? Crystal Castle. Corey calls it Summerland, the crystal castle beyond the Rainbow Bridge, and he says he's been there several times. Shirley calls them out-of-body experiences, and she remembers the first time Corey told her about one. And he said, I went to the bridge, and I saw all my friends there waiting for me, and they want me to come across the bridge. He said, but I told them I wasn't ready yet. And my heart was like, <laughs> you know, because I knew that people had seen bridges and that kind of thing. So I said, well, who was there? He said, oh, Chris, sir, and, you know, your grandfather, and he named up all these people that he knew that had been deceased. And um, our dog that died two summers ago was there. He said, wagging his tail and waiting for him. And he said all the people had their arms outstretched, like, you know, they wanted him to come across. And <clears throat> he told him he would be back soon when everybody was ready, but that he wasn't quite through here. Corey has had several friends who have died, and he reported seeing them in Summerland. He brought back messages some of them impossible to explain. He'd gone to Summerland in his sleep that morning, and he didn't see Chris, and I said, well, where was Chris here? And he said, he was um, showing his grandfather around. And I said, oh, really? Well, the next day we went to the hospital for treatment, and while she was doing a bone marrow on Corey, the doctor said, oh, by the way, Teddy Smith died. And I said, oh? And she said, yeah, he died yesterday morning at four. And I said, I already knew that. She said, oh, you know, did Darlene call you? And I said, no. <laughs> Corey went to Summerland and knew that Chris was showing his grandpa around. Whether you call them dreams or visions or out-of-body experiences, Corey's visits to Summerland gave him a piece about dying. After three relapses and five years of painful treatment, he asked his mother to let him go off chemotherapy. Christmas night, he was, I was tucking him in, and he just turned to me and said that he was through. He said, I'm tired of being sick. I've gone five years on treatment for everybody else, and now I want to quit for me. Corey got his good time, eight short weeks when he felt really well. Then in mid-February, he began to relapse again. The Wishing Well program sent him to Los Angeles, where he got to meet his TV hero, the Knight Rider. He even got to try out the car. But this was the last hurrah, and Corey knew he wouldn't be getting better. By spring, he was on constant medication for pain and needed a wheelchair. He had lost the use of one eye, and his slim body was swollen by the drugs he had to take. Still, he didn't take any of it sitting down. His friend Brian runs a popcorn stand at Pike Place Market, and Corey asked if he could come down and work for him on Saturdays. It just shows you, I think, uh, little kids have a lot more on the ball than, than grown-ups give them for credit for and uh, that's that's what I've seen in Korea it's amazing barely able to stand he talked about going skiing and wondered if he could still roller skate it was harder and harder for him to go to school but he had started a special project there and he wanted to finish he was beating a pair of earrings for his mother his classmates knew as he did that time was running short it's sort of scary that he might die right there he doesn't seem afraid, he just takes it. I guess he's lived with it all his life, that's probably why. I guess I could say that he's taught me a lot of things. 
As we talked to the children, we began to realize what an effect Corey has had on his school. I mean, it's like he's not even afraid that he's going to die. I used to be afraid of dying, but not anymore. How okay. come? Because Corey, Corey said you should be afraid because everybody has to die. So I just said, okay. This has had a real special effect on us and our own mortality. I mean, touching each one of us, realizing that Corey may not be here tomorrow. And this time Beverly Bernard is principal of Pinehurst Alternative School, where Corey's been a student for two years. She told us an amazing story about Corey and how he had counseled several of his schoolmates who were considering suicide. He has a, a wisdom about death that, that not even I have. I mean, that he knows more about it. And, and um, he cared and wanted to know. I told him about what was going on. He touched in with all of those kids. Do you know what he said to the students he counseled about suicide? He uh, wanted them to know that, that that was because that when you had a healthy body, that um, you weren't supposed to destroy it. And he said that he wished that the most important thing he wished is that he would have a healthy body, and that he would want to stay. This would be Corey's last day at school. He wouldn't finish the earrings, but maybe he had already completed his real job here. He knew that he came here to teach this lifetime and um, has accepted that his time would be short. But the, the number of people that he's touched in his short lifetime is incredible. Can you tell us a bit what it's like? To be a little boy and have leukemia. It's rough. Corey's influences traveled far afield. Two years ago, he made a teaching film with Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross, famed author and researcher in the field of death and dying. She still uses his drawing of the Crystal Castle in her talks to dying patients. He's affected his sister Bri, who's losing her favorite playmate. And he's affected all the members of a support group called Danica. It's for families of children with life-threatening diseases. We asked group leader Christine DeVario what Corey has meant to them. And really has brought us very, very much clo closer together. I mean, the feeling, the feeling of closeness that I have to um, Eileen and Steve and Shirley and the other people is just, like all, is just so much more so now than before. When we visited Corey a few days ago, he was sleeping most of the time. A peaceful hush had settled over the house, an air of tranquil waiting. I miss him already. Um, the biggest thing for me about losing Corey is that um, as a parent, you know, you always, when you're pregnant even, you have all these hopes and dreams about your kid being present someday or, you know, making some real monumental change in humanity. And, and I think Corey's done that. I mean, he's lived a really full life for a little boy that just turned nine.